Let me introduce our two speakers. They are Shriram and Kowi, and they are from Grab. And the title of the talk is UX for Hyperlocal Map in Southeast Asia. Floor is yours. Hey folks, good afternoon. Uh, great to be here at my first SOTM and the same for Kobe. Uh, hard to follow Chris, but hopefully I can connect some of the dots from what he talked about mapping small towns. Um, we'll share a little bit on the other side of how we use these to build hyperlocal experiences for our consumers back in Southeast Asia, where we operate. Okay, uh, so Kobe and I are from Grab and we have got a good sized contingent from Grab here. Uh, for those who don't know what Grab is, Grab is uh, one of the larger super apps in Southeast Asia. So we operate in eight countries, um, every country except Laos and Brunei. And um, we provide a range of services for our consumers. Grab is a public company. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there in case you want to read up on it. But we started as a taxi hailing company uh, roughly 10 years back. Right? Uh, we've since then added on food delivery services, grocery services, um, package and courier delivery, payments is one of the services that we offer. There is a set of other partner enabled services like ferry rides and so on. Right? Um, Grab's stated mission is to create economic empowerment for people in Southeast Asia. Right? Uh, what it translates into is one of two entrepreneurs that comes out of Southeast Asia, we want to have empowered them, not just in terms of making money, but in terms of providing them those opportunities to build these businesses. Right? These are what we call driver partners who you know, uh, work on our delivery and transportation businesses or merchants who sell their wares on our platform. Right? And uh, we, as part of the Grab Maps team, uh, play a sizable role. Um, OSM powers a lot of these, like we'll share a little more in terms of what Kobe will share. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, so in those eight countries that we operate in Southeast Asia, we cover roughly 480 cities, so really small towns like the one Chris talked about, uh, all the way to the mega capitals of Jakarta, which is 20, 30 odd million people. Right? And uh, we have millions of driver partners driving these roads every single day. Um, we cover all the roads which are drivable in Southeast Asia a few times a day uh, during the course of just operating our business, if you will. Uh, this slide is probably familiar to uh, the folks who um, saw the keynote in the morning. Richard, I think, stole our thunder. We had to scramble a little bit and change up the slides afterwards. But uh, this is how we serve our consumers on the Grab Consumer app. Right? Uh, location is key for businesses like ourselves, like ride hailing and food delivery. So the instant a driver or a consumer opens up their app, location starts kicking in, geolocating the user, where they are, what are the services that are available to them. A user searches for going from point A to B, so the search for the location or the point of interest uh, that's been delivered by our services. Right? Once a user has booked a transport ride, they wait for their car to arrive and we tell them it will be there in three minutes, so please go down and wait for your car. Right? That's powered by the services that our teams build. Right? Um, all the way till the drivers, we have top class navigation experiences that tell the driver which routes to drive, um, how soon can they get there, right? And keep them gainfully employed throughout the day, right? And minimize as much wastage as we can in their livelihoods. Uh, a last slide on setting the hand over to Kobe. Um, Kobe will talk about some of the solutions, but we operate in a really interesting part of the world, right? Uh, the gifts, and I'm very glad that we are able to play them for you, right? Show you a sense of what the problems that our users face, uh, either a passenger or a driver. There are narrow roads, they're unpaved. Um, our drivers stop and ask for directions right, because it's not mapped anywhere. Our merchants, they operate out of their homes. There might be a shop in the front of the house through which they sell goods, but you might have to go to the back of the house to be able to collect delivery of whatever they are selling. Right? Um, all of these are very interesting challenges and I'm sure other parts of the world which are emerging face similar problems, right? And many a times we have to go in there and put in that extra effort to be able to map some of these. We'll not talk about that mapping bit today. Uh, quite a lot of it has been covered. Kobe will talk you through um, how we think about solving these problems. How do we understand more about these problems our users face? And what do those experiences look like in our apps? What do you think? So for my side, I'll talk, just talk about and how we talk, um, well, how we actually um, do reserve research and then actually translate that into a design. As you can see from here, the very 
so that our current digital map track experience does not provide a complete experience for the locals to navigate and explore their neighborhood. And why is it so? <clears throat> Later on, I'll explain about it. The second part is um, we deploy this user research right uh, on the ground. Designing hyperlobic map starts with understanding the users in their day-to-day -day journey. So you can't just sit in your room and think about some ideas, right? You've got to go to the ground. So this is where we understand the locals. So we fly to Indonesia, go to second tier city. And what do we do next? After we get all this information of the insights, right? We need to translate the insights into a design and then create an artifact and show to the user. This is how it looks like. Without building artifacts, it's all ideas. So we translate insights of local people in a tier two city into the app design. And finally, after we do that, what do we do next? You need to validate. Otherwise, how do you know your design works? So next, we get up close and personal. How do we do that? We organize local groups, focus groups. We, these are all our driver partners. We get to know them, we interview them, we understand them. We have other events like in a grab a drink session where all the driver delivery partners go to a place. We send designers down, send researchers down to get to know them better. Third, online, offline, as you can see from here, right? We ask, hey, why is it designed this way? We communicate. So a lot of stuff we communicate and understand well. Not, it is less on the UI, more on what are they thinking about. That is very hard. Okay, we understand what really matters. First, one of the key insights that actually came from the user research, right, is that in Indonesia, as you can see from here, the place and access roads are often closed by the locals, either permanently. We also notice that in tier two city, look at the road condition, it's narrow, it's unpaved. Steep gradient. Do you want to work on this one? Activities hubs along the routes. You can have a marriage set up there and then whole day you can't move. What do you do next? This is hyper local. And here, you know, we put activities along the routes. Environment factors as well. Would you want to walk in a road where there's a lot of heavy vehicles moving in? After that, when you meet your friends, the whole body is all sand. The last People still feel unsafe because although you show a route, they feel unsafe because it could lead to dark alleys and they could get robbed, like for example, in Teotihuacan City in Palambang. They don't trust. So the highest level is how do you make them feel trust the product they're using? So, so before we even start straight away, take a phone, design it, right? We want to establish a set of design principles so that you know the design we created is consistent across the products and help us inf make an informed decision because it is not just one person designing it. You could have two or three. And the first one principles we, we think about is automate where possible. Add quality to experiences by making them effortless. What does that mean? Often we think about design, right? Create an icon, make it pretty, add new feature, or oh, people will like start to use it. It's easy to do that. I mean, the most difficult is actually how do you actually create value to it? Make the U1 invisible, make it effortless. People appreciate, do less, make it more efficient. That is a daunting task, if you ask me. Second, present with clarity. Translate complex information into simple experiences. Translate complex information into simple experiences. You know, it's easy to say, you know, designing a phone, right? I like this information, I put that information because you like it, everybody, this, this user likes it, so you actually can put in. But the most difficult is what information is not relevant to the user. You strip it off. The most critical information should be presented for the user to see. Translating complexity into simple experiences. That you need to understand from the user by talking to them, communicating to them. So that is what I mean by present with clarity. Third, 
within the context, focus on the nuances that matter in our region for our users. Nuances in our region. What is nuances in Southeast Asia? Do we know that Southeast Asia, everybody is using Android phone, 4.3 inch display? Do you want to design a phone where you know the padding size is big, where the Indonesian the, the, the content is very long and you can't even see it? Or old uncles when they're driving, right? They look at it this way. How can you have the font size being, being so slow, small? So we need to understand the local people, how they feel, how they use the devices. Focus on utility over aesthetic. So this is like navigation, for example. How can you have, you know, we often, when we talk about utility, it's about short content, bigger cap spacing, you know, clarity of the font, readability. Do not design something where you deploy beautiful curly fonts. When drivers look at it, they can't even know what that means. This is what I meant by utility over aesthetics in glance in the face. So the second part is, you know, how do we engage deeply with the community to build and maintain maps? Because you need all this data. First, missing roads. A quarter of the Southeast Asia edits on OSM are by the Grab data team. Street complete. Street complete campaigns in Thailand, we did street campaigns in Thailand, have contributed to close to 15k of missing data points. We have our imagery, which is the Kara view, 100 over k of 61 images publicly available and used by the OSM community worldwide. And the fourth, driver partners feedback. We have our driver transportation deliveries partners as well. They provide feedback and contribute back to the OSM. That is very powerful. And then last, we have our GeoSAS program. It's a virtual program in nine universities that enables the younger generation to explore the world. You know, to we'll build the entire end-to-end -end system. And just now I talk about the research we have done in Hyperlocate. We talk about being with the drivers, right? How do you translate to a design? So here is just one or two design concepts we actually created. So people in, in, in Indonesia, right? <clears throat> so when they walk, you know, we always talk about shortest ETA distance, five minutes, but to them is, I don't want to walk in a place where it's dusty, you know, I'm wearing so nice. Could you actually tell me where is place there is no dark alleys because they are fighting Palambang? Could you just tell me there's no heavy vehicles where there's huge air pollution because I don't want to look myself so dirty when I meet my friend? They want the experience. These are some of the, um, if you can see some mock-ups. So it's a crowdsourcing hyperlocal data from users. The second one is about safe route. I just thought, just now talk about um, dark alleys, right? So here's a short visualization of dark alleys. Uh, no, sorry, not dark alleys, but the routing. So over here, maybe I go to the next slide. Um, over here, you can see that there's a lot of details on a map. Why is that for? Because one of the insights that came from the users is, could you surface certain information, right? That helped me make a decision. If there's something happening there, right, which is, um, I could see some videos over there. I know maybe I wouldn't want to walk that route. And, and this is, um, and also like if you walk, right, do I need to cross accessibility in terms of crossing the bridges, crossing the crossroad? Is there where I can see some icons? Now let's go deep inside already, because now you see the details. The first one, hyper local map updates, right? This is like passengers, not passengers, but users in, living in second tier city. They have weddings event. Once you put a wedding event there, half a day is gone. Whether you are walking, whether you are drivers. Poop up condition, they don't like to walk on like potholes, you know? So they don't want the quality of the route. Is there a way we could do crowdsourcing to make it even better for them to, that they can contribute across in the community? Free illumination is another big one quality of the environment such as dust and heavy vehicle like this right it will never happen in singapore because this is not a problem but second tier city it came out short video there's so much you can see in just photo a video will show you a lot more immersive experience accessibility icons i mean wheelchair bicycle when i cross the overhead bridge i got to carry it up is there a way we could provide accessibility icons to look at the route, make a quick decision, choose which one. You have steep road entrance of building, 
entry of tunnel overhead bridge. And of course, detail routing, walking route. You don't walk, walk on the main road. If there is a footpath, you walk on a footpath. And last, which I just want to talk about, right? How do you make the product user trust? So we need a lot of people to contribute back in. And user encouraged to rate the quality of the trip. And you know, this is, um, these are some of the concepts I just want to talk about, right? Um, I want to share one key learnings. We, we have this uh, grab navigation, which is used broadly by our gra uh, drivers. I think it's quite successful. I spent quite a number of years building it. In the span of a couple of years, I was trying to condense all my talks in just 20 seconds. The first, before you even start about talking about UI, right? You need to understand the hearts and minds of the drivers in the areas of UX, like concerns such as does the phone actually take a lot of data? Why is the country small display? My phone is a low performance. Please do not look so much. These are some of the thinking the driver is thinking about. So this is how it looks. So we actually translate that right to ensure that you know the clarity of direction arrow is huge, right? Because there's not a lot of address on the road, so there's no point displaying that. So we use arrow to tell them. Most of them illiterate as well. Auto tolls integration in the driver app. So we have the tolls on the roads. So these are automatically, you know, basically this is a driver app where our delivery drivers or our transportation actually uses it. So when you go to a toll track, all the calculation, all the you know, payment is uh, deducted easily. Third, clear visual route. Thick route, high contrast color to help driver. Just not talk about anchors right, like this. You can't see, right? The route has to be thick, high color contrast. This is something we want to capture the heart of the drivers, use that. It could be simple, but they get it. Information and the control of the fingertips. If you look at the screen right here, as a driver, you don't have to toggle between the apps. Just to go to here, you get your deliveries, all within one app navigation. That's it for our presentation, but also Srim would like to add on something. Just to wrap, um, you probably are wondering why are we talking about UX at a SOTM conference? What happened to all the SOTM data or the OSM data, right? Um, hopefully this gave you a sense of, you know, the kind of things that OSM as a data source for us enables. Um, we have millions of consumers who face these problems day in and day out, right? And here are some of the ways that we look at solving some of those. Um, at the last focus group discussion that I had with a driver, he asked me, if Grab would provide him with a dirt bike. And I was wondering why. And it turned out the reason was we were routing him over a small hill uh, to deliver food. And that doesn't work, obviously, with a regular motorcycle, right? So it's, it's someone's livelihood that depends upon us having that type of data in OSN, right? And so that's, that's why we do what we do. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting and very passionate uh, talk. I think we all uh, appreciated it. We have one question, but of course I invite you to ask more uh, on Venueless. The question is about utility against aesthetic. So why do you think utility is over aesthetic? Don't you think that they support each other more than compete? I, I, I think depending on how, okay. I think it depends on how we look at it. So let's say if, if we're designing for a driver app in a one arm doing distance, right? You have a phone which is curly as in a lot of strokes. This aesthetic looks nice. Um, is it functional? Yes. But at that viewing angle, does it help the driver do their work better? It's always, does it make their work better? It's kind of dangerous, might be. But then if you talk about if the phone I'm using in a handheld way, then I think choosing a great phone works so depending on the context. I hope I answered the questions. Thank you. I don't see other questions. Any question from the audience? Please. I just, uh, I think your presentation covers this in some ways, but I wanted to ask for reiteration. Um, you cover mapping and map product and UX for your region. And I think that's, you do a really good job like representing maps for Southeast Asia. What do you think another region such as like Latin America uh, could learn for like building a similar product for their own region? Absolutely, fantastic question, Chris. I think uh, that's one of the things where applicability of the problems that we see 
and maybe potentially some of the solutions that we have come up with uh, is wider than just our region, right? Uh, city structures or density of populations or um, growth in demographics, right? That gets shared across the world in many parts, uh, in many ways, right? Uh, Southeast Asia is, is no different from Latin America or some parts of Africa and so on, right? So it absolutely applies, right? Um, we, um, as a business, operate just in Southeast Asia, but we are very open to sharing some of our thoughts or learnings with other folks. In fact, we have conversations with other people in our industry, right, hailing or food deliveries, and we end up sharing those. Um, OSM or SOTM is another area where feel free to please come talk to us and we'd be more than happy to talk more. Thank you. Anyone else? We have some time, so actually I have a question uh, for you. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on how you manage uh, the information that is crowdsourced, for example, and specifically the information that we typically do not include in OpenStreetMap, like uh, events or like the condition of the uh, footpaths or the roads? Uh, so how do you get this information? How do you verify? And, uh, for example, in the case of road uh, uh, damages, uh, how do you check when this is over, when this is fixed, for example, and how you update your uh, database? Right. So, so one of the key assets that we as a um, ride hailing and food deliveries company has is our driver partners, right? Um, we have a few million of them, and most of them are on the streets um, eight to 10 hours a day, right? And this is part of them earning income for themselves, but at the same time also providing us the data that helps us build these services that they earn their income on, right? So when a driver reports, and I think Kobe had one of the screenshots of a driver giving us feedback, okay? we cross verify with a bunch of other drivers if they are sending us the same feedback we also have a set of people on the ground in each country they might not just necessarily be part of the grab maps team they are the folks who help us operationalize transport and deliveries and so on right so there are ways in which we can do those checks we obviously use all the other tools which are available in terms of you know uh, what chris talked about and automatically doing a bunch of detections we use our uh, driver partners as a way of doing ground checks as quickly as possible. So that's the primary way we essentially crowdsource and you know cross validate a bunch of these. Great. So you use crowdsourcing as a measure of quality also. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. If there are no other questions, I would uh, uh, ask you to put your hands together again for the speakers.